the amazing movie, huh? Yeah. All right, so once again, let me extend my, my welcome to all of you. We at the DePaul Humanities Center are really pleased to have you here with this evening. I'd also like to thank Shannon Tinu, who will be joining us for the next hour as our ASL interpreter. Thanks very much, Shannon. So, in just a few minutes, um, our uh, guest of honor is going to be joining us, of course. But by means of introduction, though, I thought maybe we could take a moment to think together about this art and what it is exactly that Michael Shannon does so brilliantly. What is it that an actor is and does, and what is it that makes a truly great actor such as Michael? When Michael's character in Take Shelter says, it's more than a dream, it's a feeling, he's speaking, of course, about his sense of impending doom, but we can take this claim to mean something larger for our purposes. So, I'm a philosopher, and it's an occupational hazard, I suppose, that I tend to give more weight to rational argument than feelings. But the truth is that my profession, and in general, Western culture after the Enlightenment, have too often seen reason and emotion as somehow at odds, even in the realm of aesthetics. We academics especially tend to look at art for the lesson, the message, the meaning, as if the emotions that art employs and that art conjures up are not fundamentally constitutive of that message and meaning. For instance, if the environment might be coming to an apocalyptic end, then we need careful argument and reasoned action. But if we don't think that feelings of sadness, fear, hope, love, and empathy are necessarily part of that solution too, then we're fooling ourselves and we're truly doomed. Emotions and rationality are co-constitutive. Without one, the other is never really possible. Even philosophy is literally a love of wisdom not a cold acknowledgement of wisdom's utility, but a love of knowing, a philo-sophistry. And yet, French philosopher René Descartes dreamed of stuffing his emotions into a closet in his mind so he could think clearly, and German philosopher Immanuel Kant even argued that ethics should be emotion-free, the one true moral law based only on pure abstract logic. Emotion and intellect are pitted against each other as a result, but any attempt to portray one in isolation without the other it's never really authentic. As history shows, it's all too easy for a philosopher to put forward something cold and analytically drawn. And it's all too easy for an actor to put forward something melodramatic or passionately affective yet hollow. We all probably know what the latter looks like. Bad acting is not about just a stilted line delivery, but about an emotion that seems so inaccurate typically so overdone, so untempered by thought and intellect, that it rings somehow false to us. You got to take me to the party <laughs> So, I hope you'll forgive me for that. It's easy to make fun of somebody for trying and failing, and that's not at all what we're about at the DeVal Humanity Center. We are instead about dedicating dedicating ourselves to thinking about the ways in which the arts and humanities are integral to living a good life and in which they might be integral even for our collective salvation. I have no doubt that my own acting abilities wouldn't even measure up to the level of your daring me apart, Lisa. But the point here is that it's a complicated, multi-layered reason that this is true. It's one thing to know, even, that emotion and rationality are not really separate. That's hard enough to accomplish in the first place. But Simply thinking and knowing doesn't make one a great actor. Acting, like any art, is something we all can understand if we work at it, but it's not something we all can do well, no matter how hard we work. Perhaps we could all get better, but few of us will ever be great. It's not just that Michael Shannon understands, but that his measured performances are both cerebral and emotive, intellectual and moving, alive in such a deep way that they don't ever amount to a pretending to be alive. So our theme this year at the DePaul Humanity Center has been the year of the fake. And one of the issues that's at the center of that investigation is the role that art plays in uncovering truth, and the senses in which art demonstrates to us by its very nature that truths and lies are not really all that there is. The world is far more complex. In the 2006 film Bug, playing a man who believes that the government has implanted microscopic insects in his teeth. Michael's character doesn't act paranoid. 
His actions are those of someone who sees the world through a veil of paranoia. That's an important distinction. The world in which he lives is so completely and genuinely constructed for us through his way of being in the world that we cannot help but inhabit that world with him. Michael shows us a character who so unambiguously believes the twisted logic of his conspiracy theories that that logic shines through to us as well. We may not feel the bugs, but we feel how and why he might feel them. Two years later, in a role for which he earned his first Oscar nomination, Michael plays another character, someone on the, somewhere on the spectrum of sanity, showing up in Sam Mendes' revolutionary road as a man so crazy that he knows and speaks the truth. In just two brief scenes, he proves the only character able and willing to recognize the festering bourgeois reality at the heart of Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet's character's marriage. And Michael manages to convey this truth with such complex emotional authenticity that we too are able to see the emperor's new clothes. And along with Michael, we cannot help but laugh even while we seethe with anger at the hypocrisy of it all. The hypocrisy, that is, not only of this marriage on screen, but of everything around us today that falsely labels itself as anti-establishment, when all it is is yet another manifestation of complacent normalcy. It's understandable why Michael was nominated for the industry's highest award for this performance. Not only is it difficult to be the truth teller when truth is not in fashion, though, let's be honest, is it ever really in fashion? But think of the complexity of that emotion that he so perfectly feels for and with us. He laughs and seethes, I've said. That's hard to pull off. Thinking about emotions is a tricky business. Reason wants to dissect them and break them into their smallest parts to understand their workings. But like a frog displayed on a biology student's tray, what is left after the dissection isn't the same beast at all. Something is missing. This is in part because the being together of things is part of their essence. We cannot take all the pieces of a jumbo jet, throw them on the runway, and wonder why nothing takes off. And so an actor cannot laugh and then seethe with anger and assume it will capture what it really means to experience the complicated emotion of anger, frustration, pity, and desperation in such a way that it truly elicits both a sense of tragedy and comedy. In phenomenology, the branch of philosophy in which I do the majority of my work, we call this being together categoriality. Categoriality helps us understand how buttered bread is its own thing, not just bread plus butter. How the parts of a frog put together the right way are more than just a bunch of frog parts. It also helps us understand that complicated emotions, when felt together, create something brand new and not just a mere amalgam. Think, for instance, of what it means to have the experience of a thrill on a roller coaster. The thrill experience is an example of categoriality. It's the being together of feeling both frightened and safe. To cold, rational logic, this seems a contradiction. Feeling frightened cancels out feeling safe. But emotions, and the whole world in general, they don't operate by this sort of logic. If I don't feel safe on a roller coaster, I'd be a fool to get on the ride. But if I don't feel frightened, then there's no point to get on the ride, no reason to be there. We can hold conflicting and complicated emotions together at the same time because they don't add up and subtract like numbers. Thrill is the name we might give to this feeling of being safe and frightened at the same time. It takes a nuanced actor to understand this and to understand that comedy and tragedy are not opposites. But then it takes someone who's truly exceptional at the craft to allow that categoriality to take over the flesh, to live in it authentically. Plenty of people, especially these days, act in tragic comedies, but these are usually more accurately comedies with some tragic moments or tragedies with some funny things. When Michael's eyes widen at the realization of just how full of it Leonardo and Kate's, char Kate's characters are when they're talking about their own aspirations, as if they too were not caught up in the same bourgeois dreams as everyone else in their suburb, we see, him, we see in him the deep truth of how anger, frustration, pity, and desperation can appropriately come together in an outraged laugh, a bemused bit of screaming. Teamed up with the great Werner Herzog in 2009's My Son, My Son, What Have You Done, Michael razzle-dazzles. 
turning what might even be a throwaway scene for others into an intense character study. Accomplishing all of this, for instance, with a mere expression on his face while filming a short dialogue-free scene in China that is unexplained and otherwise completely unrelated to the narrative of the movie. That these complicated ways of being human are enfleshed, that we carry our consciousness in our extended bodies is something that Michael just exudes. I think, for instance, of how from 2010 to 2014, Michael took his Broadway, broad, um, Boardwalk Empire character, federal agent Nelson von Elvin, on a journey. A journey that, though likely far removed from most of our experiences, rang true to us each week. How easy it would be to play greed and corruption in a cartoony way. A good man suddenly salivating when he sees how the other half lives. A wolf staring down at the sheep. None of that for Michael, though. Instead, he was the shepherd who turned on his own flock, and then turned on the world at large. A prohibition officer and religious man who in one utterly reasonable series of unreasonable actions became what he had sworn to persecute. I remember the Sunday night when I watched Agent Van Alden force his partner into a river baptism, the dunking going on for just a moment too long, the murder, the drowning, portrayed by Michael as something so surprising and violently ruptured in one moment, and then completely inevitable and almost banal in retrospect. What an incredible gift to be able to not be a cartoon monster when called on to act such scenes, but instead to find a place within the character that makes him frighteningly sensible to us, as if to say the shepherd's crook could be in our hand at any moment. This is what makes Michael's portrayal of General Zod in 2013's Man of Steel the best thing about that movie. <laughs> He's not really a superhero villain. He's just a guy trying to remain true to his job and a way of life that has come to an end, ready to do horrible things that don't appear as horrible to him given the other horrors he's witnessed. On a different planet, Michael's General Zod could have ended up being Colonel Strickland from The Shape of Water, somehow thinking it's right to dominate and silence everything and everyone around him. Or even real estate broker Rick Carver in 99 Homes, feeding off the deepening coastal shelf of misery that poet Philip Larkin once told us man passes on to man. These are all men doing horrible things, but doing them in a horrible world that has defined what it is to be a man as to be someone doing horrible things. We are in some sense beyond good and evil when we're in Michael's hands. Not because there's no evil, no good to be done in the world, but because those categories serve no purpose when trying to understand the motivations for actions. Everyone always thinks he's doing good. And all of this is at work as well in what makes the viral internet video in which Michael appeared the same year he was on so deeply brilliant. And until he invented greater superlative, there really can be no other word for this performance other than brilliant. Lending a male voice that Michael has perfected to a letter written by a woman who's the president of her local Delta Gamma sorority chapter, chastising her sisters for their recent behavior, Michael doesn't so much turn this series of molehill concerns into mountains as his intensity increases beyond all reasonable limits, but instead suggests the comedic nature of the tragedy that's in all of our outrages and conceits. Because mountains and molehills are always a question of perspective. Perhaps nothing is truly a mountain, in the sense that there's always a larger perspective, history will erase everything we do anyway, and someday the sun will enlarge and engulf the earth. Yet, things always matter to us, because we humans are creatures who create and look for meaning. This, now, here, it matters. And it's a question of how we treat each other once we realize this in the end. The angry sorority president, she's merely the campus Zod trying her best to shoot lasers from her eyes while she plays a ridiculous game that we should somehow all be above, and yet none of us really are. But we understand that conviction, though, because Michael is so talented at the complexities of emotions, rationality, power, cultural expectations, and I think in a deep way, he understands that those complexities are actually experienced as something simple from the inside. In Midnight Special, he's a guy who loves his son and wants to protect him. It's that simple, yet that complicated. I know that I more completely understand jealousy after watching Michael and Frank and Lola, because he shows us how simply Frank can ruin his life with complicated feelings. 
and in the greatest portrayal of Elvis Presley since Andy Kaufman passed away. I finally got how important it was to Elvis to be deputized as a federal agent, because Michael's portrayal of the king in Elvis and Nixon makes that passion, however opaque and, let's admit it, completely nutty it appears from outside, seem like something that made perfect sense to Mr. Presley himself. And in two films from 2016, in contention with the best of the new millennium, I think, Complete Unknown and Nocturnal Animals, that same genius is at work. In Tom Ford's exploration of regret, Michael's dying Texas cop in Nocturnal Animals is a fictional character with a fictional character's work of fiction. This play within a play conceit goes back at least as far as Hamlet, but in Michael's hands, it's not merely a mechanism to catch the conscience of the king, or in this instance, the conscience of Amy Adams, queen, but instead shows us how our understandings of justice are never really divorced from our passions and from the particularities of our lives. Justice is not some platonic ideal from another realm, but it's as local and dangerous and dirty as an abandoned trailer in Texas or a cancerous tumor that has no goal beyond its own will to expand. The role rightly earned Michael his second Academy Award nomination. And in Complete Unknown, one of the finest cinematic explorations of identity and longing ever, it's impossible to imagine anyone other than Michael playing the role of Tom so successfully, a man who is suddenly thrust into the center of a crossroads at his birthday party. When a friend brings a date, played by Rachel Weiss, Tom is sure he knows from his past, yet she claims not to remember him at all. At that moment of possibly choosing to abandon one life, one identity, one role, and take up another running off, Michael captures the thrill of it all in the most intricate roller coastery sense of that word. And we're not sure if he'll eventually slide more toward fear or safety right up until the final closing moments of the film. So, in the end, categoriality can perhaps help us understand a great deal about acting and the art of being an actor. It shows us how we're able to take someone on stage or on film to be that character and also not be that character at the same time. We don't believe that Michael Shannon is his character Curtis from Take Shelter, Yet, we completely feel for Curtis in the film that we just watched. Because Michael makes him so present, we worry about him. We fear that as he strives to protect his daughter from an imagined danger, perhaps the greatest danger to which he's exposing her is a risky cochlear implant operation for potentially unsound reasons. We feel with him as he opens the door to his storm shelter, not knowing if there's still a world. And we want to run with him when the oily rain is falling at the end whether it's literally falling or not, whether or not there's any place left to which we can run. That we can see both Michael and Curtis there at the same time is due to the skill of that actor. A and not A do not cancel each other out, but add up to something completely other when presented by an artist who truly gets it, by that rare artist who just embodies the truth and then offers it up to us. It's more than a dream, it's a feeling, he says. How lucky we are to have such an artist in our midst, shouting true lies and false truths and everything else in heaven and earth at us. It's more than a dream, it's a feeling. I feel incredibly lucky to have this dream made a reality. Being able to say to you, friends, please help me welcome to the stage the incomparable Michael Shannon.
year. That means a lot. Thank you very much. That's like, very people are always like, oh, you're going to be in a comedy? I'm like, they're all comedies. <laughs> So, had it been a while since you had seen uh, Take Shelter, or? Are you it had, it? Yeah. that's why I wanted to watch it, because I'm all the time saying to people that it's my favorite movie I've ever made, and I wanted to make sure that was still true. Because <laughs> <laughs> I just keep saying it all the time. So, How'd it turn out? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know if favorite is the right word, but um, I would say of all the movies I've made, um, it kind of, speaks to my own life experience the most, probably. Um, you know, when, when Jeff wrote this movie and, and gave it to me, um, I had never felt such synchronicity with another artist. It was astonishing to me that he was, that he had written this, that he had thought of it, um, and that he was asking me to do it. It was just, uh, it was the perfect uh, aperture for channeling what I still, to this day, am struggling with as a person. And it seems like maybe perhaps other people are, too. You know, just the feeling of, you know, how hard it is to live in, the, in this world, you know, the way it is yeah. nowadays. And how you know, I always say to people when they ask, you know, is Chris, so is he crazy or is he not crazy? I'm like, well, I, to me, the question is, how do you, how do you keep yourself from going crazy? Mm -hmm. Like, when you're constantly just a waterfall of anxiety every day, it's like, it's a challenge. Like, don't go crazy. Like, I defy you not to. <laughs> just take all this in and be like, it's okay. It's fine. I'm fine. Yeah. We seem to have a society set up to do that to people. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but yeah. So anyway, uh, it was it was very nice to see it again. And, That's great. And you know, I I love. Uh, it was very moving. I, that that little girl Toba just really breaks my heart. She's just, <laughs> I felt I was thinking the night I was like, you know, I haven't spoken to her or her family in a long time. I don't. You know, she's probably. This was 2010. Yeah, she's you know, she's probably you know 16 years old now, 15, 16. I just haven't seen her in a while. I'm seeing Jessica and and all the uh, you know sh my friend Shay playing Duart and uh, yeah, it was just very moving to to see the people. You know. Yeah, it seemed like you and your daughter had a really good rapport. Like when she smiled, it seemed so genuine. When she yeah, was she just was a little. All the light that one. She was just um, so sweet, and you know when when I did this movie, I just had my, my daughter not too long ago, my first daughter. So it was it was nice to be able to apply that to something. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Well, one of the things that just watching it again now, this is the fourth or fifth time I've seen it, I think. One of the things that it seems clear to me comes up as a theme of the craziness of the world is the environmental message. Mm. And I mean, there's a lot of craziness in every direction, but it sure seems like in some ways, Curtis is the person saying, look, we're headed towards something horrible environmentally. Nature's turned against, even the dog, right? Nature has turned against us and no one wants to listen. And so it makes you think you're a crazy person if you notice it and no one else does. Yeah, you know, it's like when I was um, a teenager, Myself, um, I was, I mean, I still am, but I was super deeply concerned about the environment. So much so that I uh, canvassed for uh, PERG, Illinois' PERG, uh, oh. Public Interest Relations Group. I Obama think. was part of that, wasn't he? Uh, perhaps, yeah. I think the organization itself has started somehow by Nader. Uh, Ralph Nader is somehow connected to him. But uh, uh, yeah, so I did canvassing door to door. And of course, you know, it's, it's ironic because nowadays I see them, uh, a lot of these canvassers are just on the sidewalk now. And I walk by and I think, oh, you just want money, leave me alone. But uh, <laughs> back in the day, I was trying to do the exact same thing and I would go door to door. And it just astonished me how many people just, just didn't, didn't seem to care at all. 
or didn't believe it or didn't think it was that big a deal. Or, right. And it really it was a real eye-opening experience for me because I, I thought it was a very organic thing to be concerned about like air and water. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty <laughs> rational. But you know, there's just no, the, the, I think the last day on the job, the last guy, the last door I knocked on, the guy said, you see that truck out in the driveway? I'm like, yeah, he's like, what does it say on the side? He was like a contractor or something. He's like, I, that's what I do for a He's like, I dump shit in the lake every day. He's like, I'm not gonna give you money. He's just like, it's more in my face. And I was like, okay. You can, all, you can all go suffocate for all I care. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, it's, uh, it's still in the back of my mind. <laughs> So that short-term thinking, right? Yeah. I mean, in some ways, the loan officer in the, in the movie, that he's sort of worried about the short-term. Why would you be spending all this money for something? And but it seems like right. it makes sense, yeah, right? Yeah. But also, if you really are right about the coming Armageddon, then it makes sense to be doing something. But it is, it is, to be fair, it's a very complicated issue. As a matter of fact, uh, I just directed a play called Tra Traitor. Uh, I believe the writer's here. Uh, Right there, yeah. uh, our play is at a Red Orchid Theater right now. We're about to add some cars to this. Uh, we're trying to get a ticket, but it's, it's about just how complex this, this issue really is. Uh, it, it, uh, it's based on an enemy of people by Henry Gibson, and it's about a, a small town dealing with lead contamination. And, and um, you know, I get it. The people that say, oh, yeah, let's cut regulations because the economy is so bad and we'll give jobs. It's, it's not like I don't understand it. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's complicated. Yeah. It's a great play, by the way. I saw it on Friday. Oh, Friday. you did? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Everybody needs to go see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and it. And it is an environmental play, too. It's about poisoning of the school. And even the original was about a poisoning, I think, of the, the spa. The spa, spa that's right. Uh, poisoned by some bacteria, yeah. I think sometimes part of the problem is, and, and your play brings it up, that what is the economic response to it? That it seems like the only thing we could do is an economic response, like giving money to the guy on the street. Yeah. When some, in some sense, it's a much deeper thing. It's almost an existential problem, I think, that we have with it. Unfortunately, it is, and I've been noticing that lately. You know, after the uh, election, I don't want to seem too much like an armchair liberal or whatever, but I was, uh, I was just giving a lot of money uh, online to you know, campaigns and organizations and groups and all these things. I just kept the here, here, and there. And one day I was like, wow, I've given away a, a lot of money. Uh, maybe more than I should have. And then, uh, and then a few months later, I was like, oh, absolutely nothing has changed. Hmm. I don't know if this money thing is working out. <laughs> might be better off off-track betting. <laughs> so yeah, it is, it is about more than just money, unfortunately. I guess, you know, it's, it's a crowded world and there's a lot of folks and only so many resources. I, I think the, the least you can ask for, and I don't want this to turn into some political uh, you know, rah, rah, whatever. But the least you can hope for is that the, the people that are trying to deal with these issues have some semblance of a human intelligence. Mm. That's, That's the bare minimum. There's a, there's a line in your director's notes, if I remember correctly from the play, mm -hmm. where you talk about why don't they just fire the lead? Oh, get rid of the lead. Get rid of the lead. Why oh, they get rid of the lead. Oh, so that's fascinating. So it's get rid of the lead that's in the... Oh, why the lead? lead. <laughs> All right, so this uh, is the lead, lead, lead that's moment, tricky, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> I read it. Why don't they get rid of the lead? Meaning, why don't we get rid of the people who are in charge politically and take care of this ourselves? It's true, but, you know, everybody has their own uh, itineraries and agendas, and it does take a lot of time. You know, I've always thought, I, I don't know who in their right mind would want to be president because it just, it's like you'd spend four or eight years just not sleeping and not getting, uh, you know, maybe every once in a while you get to play golf or something. So, it seems very stressful. You know. Be away from your cheeseburger when you don't get to yeah. sleep that much. Yeah, yeah. And when it comes to, if you don't mind talking about the environment just for a minute, since it's ironic, because this is something that, I thought a lot about for several years, and I used to lecture quite a bit about sustainability and environmental ethics. 
And it's really just in the last couple of years that I've started wondering if maybe we do need a, an entire overhaul of the ideology. So I was asked last year to give a talk about sustainability, and I agreed, but I went there and I said, so here's why we need to argue against sustainability. Sustainability is bad. And my thinking was, Sustainability is all about, so how are we gonna find a way to keep this going, right? How can we patch this up somehow so that in general, with the fewest changes possible, all of this is going. But maybe all of this is kind of a problem, right? That it's systemic on some deep level. So we shouldn't be trying to make something that's perhaps somewhat horrible for the earth and for people who've been marginalized forever for a lot of people in the rest of the world, but to see if we can come up with some other ideas. Something new. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's tricky though. I mean, take for example, movies. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I, I love movies. People like to watch movies. Um, movies uh, create a lot of waste and they create a lot of pollution. I see it every, when I'm on set, you know, all these trucks, and generators and trailers, you know, burning fuel all day long, mm -hmm. uh, half drunk bottles of water all over the set, um, plastic bottles of water, um, uh, wasted food all over the place, you know. Um, it, it, it consumes a lot of energy, uh, and people get tired because the days are long, so they're not as thoughtful and responsible as they should be sometimes. So then it's like, well, we could just stop making movies, I guess, but but then what? What then? <laughs> I don't know what I'd do. But I would, you know, uh, it could be a good work even more. Yeah, well, yeah, I would. But that's a very toxic environment. <laughs> <laughs> I hear the biggest laugh coming from the yeah, from my fellow ensemble member. <laughs> yeah, I never forget the day I went in, and the lighting designer was spray painting all the light fixtures in the theater without uh, turning on the vents. It's like, you're gonna, you're gonna die. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so yeah, it, 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 it's an, I, I, you know, I, I honestly, I don't think we're the, we were that far away. I mean, if we just keep going, you know, solar and wind, and it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and the, you know, the thing I've learned from some documentaries I've seen is that uh, a lot of these questions already have been answered and the technology is available and it's just certain people choosing not to allow it to, to flourish. And um, mm -hmm. you know, it's not that the questions are still unanswered, it's just, yeah, the, what has to shift is the, the, the focus and the direction of the economy as a whole, which a small number of very wealthy people just are not willing to do. Right. Seems. Then I guess it depends on who gets to control those technologies too that might save us. If it's still that small group of wealthy people, yeah, we might still be in their hands as well. Yeah. But that's hard. That's a hard question. It is. I don't know. I mean, you know, I one of the big regrets I have in life, and I have several, but... Uh, <laughs> One of the big ones is I went to this screening. Remember the Great Gatsby that came out not too long ago? Sure. Yeah. And uh, I went to a screening of it in New York. It was kind of like an event. And um, there's this socialite woman who organizes these screenings, Peggy Siegel. She's like a classic New York socialite with very large jewelry and large hair and <laughs> really dresses. And, she, and she's always going around the room like, oh, you got to be. You walk in, she's like, oh, Michael, Michael, you come down, you gotta meet this, you gotta meet this. And she's pulling me down the aisle, and I turn around, and there's this guy sitting right in the aisle, very smartly dressed, elegant looking man. And before I know it, I'm shaking his hand, and she's like, uh, this is Charles Koch. And I was like, Still his day is like I could have like strangled him or <laughs> or something, but all I did was go back in time and shoot him or something. Yeah. This opportunity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, you know, I, that's why that's why maybe I should be allowed to carry a concealed weapon. <laughs> <laughs> Situations like that. Well, I don't know what you'll think 
about this, but I mean, since we're on that subject, one, one movie I didn't get to mention of yours that is one of my favorites um, is uh, The Iceman. Oh, yes. yeah. Yes. And this is beautiful, I think. And in, when I look at it, one of the things I think about it is you, the standard response is just how can somebody live this way? How can you do such horrible things and then go home to your family and love your kids and whatnot? But then I just think, well, I mean, there are a lot of people that do it, right? But in some sense, also, we're all sort of doing it, because we're all participating in a system that's destroying all the things around us, and we all just sort of go on with our happy, everyday lives and not admit that we're part of that system of violence. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, not to the extent that Richard did, but that, that was something that was going through my mind, uh, yeah. that it wasn't simply a, a biopic about some criminal. I, I, I'm not super interested in those really. Uh, I feel like there's thousands of them to choose from already and and there's some really great ones and a lot of really mediocre ones and but I don't think we need more of them. But uh, but I, I was fascinated by that more kind of like a parable or a fable, that aspect of it is or the notion that somebody can want to to have love and in their life and to have a family, all these things, and also be capable of this, this, this destruction. Um, uh, that was one of the things that uh, drew me to it, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. That's a beautiful portrayal, I think. Thank you. And maybe one of the reasons is because it, it you play it so that he seems in a weird way understandable. Not in the sense that I could do that sort of violence, but it makes me think about what am I doing that I'm completely disconnected from that might be violent. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I study them a lot. Uh, anyone can go online and, and see a lot of footage of them getting interviewed. And uh, I also read a book about them. And, um, you know, the other thing that I think drew me to the project is that when I was doing my research, Richard had one of the more nightmarish childhoods I think I've ever mm -hmm. read about. And I, that's something I always like people to think about. Although you don't really see much of his childhood in the movie, but it's like if you, if you screw with children like that, you're, you're gonna reap what you sow, you know. Um, and, uh, and but seeing, I think the child still existed in him, and the child was the one that was trying to have the family and be loved and give love to other people, and then the, the kind of. Frankenstein's monster that had been created by his upbringing was the one going around shooting people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask you a question since we brought up Trader Two about directing? So is is I this your second? It. No. Why is that? No, it's just really hard. I mean, I always I've done well. I say I always I've directed two plays uh, ever, and that's it. And. Both the plays I directed had very large casts and uh, were very complex and demanded three entirely different locations and um, yeah, were kind of bigger than the, the theater that I was trying to stage them in. Um, so, but having said that, I, I find I find both of them thrilling. I just saw a Trader yesterday for the first time in a couple of weeks and I was just like, so thrilled to, to be there and hanging on every word. I just could watch it uh, all the time. Um, but it, it, it is, is it's, it's, it's interesting how many times you can kind of say what you think is essentially the same thing uh, in a number of different ways, and, and yet another human being still has no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of the joys of directing. <laughs> you keep trying to figure out different way to say the same thing, hoping that the 50th iteration might actually penetrate. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And that's not the fault of the other person, I just, I don't make a lot of sense. <laughs> Nothing I say makes much sense, which is why I'm better off doing this, because then all I have to say are my lines. <laughs> But does that, as, a, as an artist, does that worry you that once you put something out there that it's anybody is to take out and to interpret however they want so they could really misunderstand what you Oh, and they do. And they, they do. do. They, they have uh, a lot. Uh, but that's fine. Yeah. Because that's not really my problem. 
it's like I, I've developed very, and it wasn't always this way, but I, it, I think you can't, if you do it long enough, you can't kind of help but have this real realization dawn on you that you're much better off having a kind of a, a zen detachment from it. Mm. Because you show up and you shoot your thing, and then the director goes away and you have no idea what it's going to become. You, you, and, and you can't really do all that much about it. So, I mean, um, I've just gotten to the point where I, I'm more curious to see what they what they did with all the pieces, and and and, uh, and then I'm on to the next. You know, I mean that's the other thing. I guess maybe if I only made one of these things every once in a while, I'd be a little more precious about it. But uh, I, I basically I never stop working. <laughs> Always moving on to the next thing. Yeah. Yeah. But still, it's it seems to me like. As an artist, that must be a hard thing to to just come to terms with. Although a good thing, probably good for life in general, that you put something out and then it's the world's and it's not yours. And and that worry that you work so hard on something and to make a particular point and to change the world in a particular way, and then somebody comes and sees Trader and then they leave and they say, you know, I think we should give money to the Koch brothers. He says, ah, right? it's, it's the and that's hard, but maybe it's a good lesson for life in general that this is. Right? This is letting go is a good thing, and finding ways to communicate and to keep coming back to it over and over. It's never done. It's never a finished conversation. Well, yeah, that's. I mean, that's the interesting thing about theater. I mean, that's why I ultimately prefer doing theater is because you get to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and I like doing plays more than once, um, revisiting plays, revisiting roles. Um, I've done it with a few different plays. There's some plays is like. Um, this, particularly the plays of UNESCO where they're, they're not very age specific. I, I kind of want to do them once every 10 years or something just to see um, how I've changed or how I can reinterpret it or reimagine it or, or how the world's changed in relation to it or, you know. But um, yeah, with film, you just, it, it's really about the pact that you make at the beginning. You've got to find a director that um, you believe in, yeah. and because once you basically say I'm in, you're basically just kind of signing yourself over to them. You know, right. kind of, the way I describe it is like you're some genie in a bottle or something. You come out and you're like, all right, you got three wishes. <laughs> okay, is that it? Okay, bye. You go the <laughs> bottle and then somebody else finds the bottle, and, you know. But every once in a while, you poke your head out of the bottle and you're like, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's your big choice. <laughs> that's the big choice. <laughs> Who gets to have the wishes, but then you don't get to choose the wishes. No, that's true. You don't. Right. So I, I heard you say before in an interview as well that you, in some sense, you're you kind of you're you're settled and think it's okay that what an actor's job is just be there for the director to help the director realize that vision. That particularly vision. with film. Yeah. The film. Oh. Particularly. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, and now I'm really just trying to work with people that I that I know, I respect, and I believe in, and, and that I'm 99% sure when I see the final thing, it'll, I'll be relatively happy about it. Mm -hmm. That's another fascinating thing for me this, as an as an outsider that we had Edward Watson here last year. He's the principal dancer with the Royal Ballet in London. Oh, wow. Probably one of the greatest living dancers alive today, definitely. And he said, had a very similar answer to what you said about working with a choreographer. He said he likened it to being like um, a carpenter or an electrician working for an architect. Yeah. That I, I put that in where you tell me, but it's somebody else's vision, and I just got to try to make it be as close as it can be to that. Yeah. Like you're a day laborer, essentially. Not that yeah. there's something wrong with that at all, but. No, I mean. Well, yeah, sometimes I see actors getting themselves in trouble when they, when they you know, there's this, this, this conceit, I think, or a lot of people assume that actors think that it's all about them, and they're very vain and conceited, and they want a lot of attention and approval and all these things. And, um, and, and, and there are actors, I guess, like that, and the, 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 but I think by and large, they're, they're not, I mean, particularly the ones that you probably enjoy watching. Um, 
they're just not like that. They're they're very, um, you know, you bring up like a revolutionary road. You know, here I am in a room with three, the three, three stars of Titanic. And, um, <laughs> you know, the, 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 one of the highest grossing films of all time. And they couldn't have been more down to earth, normal, friendly, and hard working. I mean, you know, that famous scene that everybody talks about, um, Leo, you know, we're sitting around dinner table and Sam Mendes had a lot of coverage for this scene. Sam Mendes had a lot of coverage in general. Um, he liked to shoot. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and the last, I think, like, the last or second to the last shot we did that day was Leo's close-up. Like, he had been off camera all day long. This, is, this guy is number one on the call sheet. And, and it, that, a person in that position could honestly be justified saying, you know what, I don't want to do my close-up at 7 o'clock at night. I, I would actually like maybe to do it a little sooner. But he never, it was never an issue, he never brought it up. We did tons of takes on everybody else. And we finally get to his close-up, and I, I bend over, and I'm in his face talking room, and I, put, I, uh, I drooled out of my mouth <laughs> onto like his crotch. <laughs> And I was like, oh no. <laughs> he didn't even, he didn't even. So we finished the take and I'm like, oh my God, Leo, I'm so sorry. That was so rude. He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. What happened? And then I told him that. And he was like, oh yeah, it's, it's all right. Don't worry. <laughs> I, like, I felt like I could have like punched him in the face. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, by and large, it's. That's what people are like, mostly. Yeah. I've, I've only ever worked with two people that I like to bury alive. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask. Yeah. I won't ask. No. A boy and a girl. It's <laughs> good to mix it up. <laughs> that far away look in your eye like you're thinking about burying it right now. Yeah. Well, they're very far away. <laughs> Good for them. <laughs> when you were talking, it made me think, in some ways, maybe it's like a, a musician, and you're a musician too, so when you're playing somebody else's music, that the idea is to make that other person's music come alive, and in some sense you're reading someone else's words who wrote them, and you're following the direction of someone. Oh yeah, look, that's the hard part. That's what I always say. The writing, the writing is the hard part. I'm not just saying that because Brett's here. I really do think the writing is. I mean, I can't do it. I couldn't write a play or a screenplay and put a gun on my head. I, didn't know. I just couldn't do it. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, and, and, and they go through so much, and they have to deal with so much uncertainty and doubt. And they're like, is what I wrote, should anybody actually ever hear or see this, or am I just insane? And so I like to say, yes, they should, and, and this is how they should hear and see it, and it'll be great, you know, like, because you need to support those people. You need, we need great, you know, great writers. Because otherwise, I mean, me in and of myself, you can say whatever you want about me, have whatever opinion you want, but if I just walk out here without material, I'm just like, hey, <laughs> no, that's, that doesn't last very long. <laughs> I think we still would have packed it at the yeah. house tonight. Like just maybe maybe for, yeah. It could be like a John Cage song or something. I could stand <laughs> Michael Shannon, one Michael hour Shannon. and five minutes. I <laughs> it would sell out. The truth yeah, is yeah, that yeah. it would. <laughs> I've gotten to that point. <laughs> well, writing is a, it's a weird thing, too. It, it has the similar challenges, I think, to acting, in that, especially when you're writing dialogue, you're doing something that's just so unnatural, I think, because we don't think about the things we're going to say before we say them, usually. Like this sentence I'm saying right now, I didn't sit and think about it for a moment. It's just, the, I'm thinking in the process of saying it. Right. And sometimes when you think, so what's this person going to say, it sounds false because no one really does that. Right. And then when you read something that someone else, it's even harder to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I, think, I think for a lot of the, the great writers, the ones that are really good at it, it's, it's very, they're able to get to a very subconscious place where it's not, like you said earlier, it's not about just reason. Like, well, this is, 
you know, this is what you're saying and this is the reason you're saying it and I want it to mean this, you know, it's more, um, it's more experiential even for them sitting there alone at the typewriter. Yeah. You know, I know in Brett's writing, <coughs> there's a lot of stuff that I know is purely experiential. I wouldn't, I would never ask Brett to be like, so Brett, why, why does he say this? Because I know that that's not the place that Brett's coming from. It's more, it's more complicated than that. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. That makes me think too of just to tie it back to the question of being in the service of somebody else. In some ways, maybe that's a good model for all art. That is to put yourself in the service of the art instead of I am the creator. Of the art, which seems like a very Western male way of thinking. Because I'm thinking now of George Saunders. We, George Saunders is a, a friend of the Humanity Center here, and he once said that when he's writing a short story or a novel, that he doesn't tell his characters what to do, that in some sense he just kind of lets it come out, what they want to do themselves, and he's a conduit for it. And I got the sense that that's more than just a, a poetic metaphor for him, that he really thinks that there's something there that he's the conduit for. It's, it, it, it defies logic, but I mean, you would think, well, you must be thinking of this, but, <clears throat> I mean, a lot of times when people, it's the same thing when people ask me, so how did you prepare for this part? I'm like, I, I don't know how I prepared for this part. I don't know. I read it and it conjured up. You have this whole matrix of things in your, in your mind and your heart and your soul and all the experiences that you've ever had in your life and all the things you've ever seen. And, and it's, it's like some switchboard that, that, that can't be explained. It's, it's, beyond, it's beyond thought. It's, um, like I said, it's just experience. It's an experience. It makes sense. And it reminds me of something I, I heard you say in another interview, I think back about the time this movie came out, and someone asked you, so did you go off and spend some time with schizophrenics? <laughs> right? And I've been doing that all my life. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't need to go off. <laughs> you heard her go. Your response was very generous, too. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Right. And then you ended by saying, you had said, well, I didn't even study anything about it because I didn't want to know more than Curtis knows. That's true. Right? And then just, I thought, oh, wow. Yeah, the That's first time true. I ever read the DSM was when we had the scene in the movie where Curtis and Moses gets the DSM from the library. Um, and then I read it. And I read it when he was so, before we did the scene where he's like, well, I had these five things, I got these two things. <laughs> I took the test. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting that Jeff puts that in a movie with the mom. I, sometimes I wonder, but like I said, it's, it's Jeff's baby, it's not mine. But I, I think that's one of the main reasons that people wind up getting so focused on um, the mental illness aspect of it is because of the mother. But, but Kathy Baker, so, she's so amazing in that scene. God. She plays my mom in the movie. Yeah. And I think in some ways maybe it's that we always want an answer for everything. Well, like, yeah. It's, it's, oh, he's schizophrenic, and then we're done. We know what happened, but that's not life, really. Well, that's something we, we, all, we all do. We, we, any of us trying to figure out, well, why the hell am I like this? You know, when yeah. the first place you started is your family. You know, it's like, well, my mom was like this, and my dad was like that, and these are my genes, my genetics, you know. Um, Another thing is in the, the, the trader genetics, you know. And then we, you know, and, and Chris Jones said, well, why didn't they take that out? Because that was all about Ibsen back in Norway and how, you know, he used to think that was a problem. And it's like, well, a lot of people still do think it is a problem. Maybe rightly or wrongly, I don't know. I would never be the arbiter of that. But uh, people still are thinking about, is it? Is it my genetics? Is that why I'm the way I am? You know, uh, that desire just to know and be done with it, though, I think it's just so. There's something deep about that, but yeah. there's some, something false about it too. That somehow we could, you know, write in one sentence, and that's why this and thing. That's happened. why I'm the yeah, way I am. Just, yeah. But you see, with this fascination with like people going online and getting their genealogies, like this. Oh my gosh! Rage, yeah, all the rage, you know. It's like. And somehow, like, you figure out that you're 5% uh, Sasquatch or whatever, you know, <laughs> it's gonna, everything's gonna become illuminated. It's like, <laughs> a dream come uh, true. Yeah. Yeah. It's that commercial with the guy who was, I think he was German and he went to 
you know, German fest, and then he finds out he's Irish, and now he's wearing a kilt. Like suddenly, now he knows who he is. Right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I think that's why I like. I don't know what you think of Michael Haneke, the director, but I love him. I love the, his movies because something horrible will happen, and then he'll not let you have any idea why. Right. Because he'll. I think in some sense he's saying. If you think you know why, you fooled yourself. So I'm not going to let that happen. It just, it happened. And that's yeah. what life is. It's a bunch of stuff that happens. Yeah. And not necessarily hear all the reasons. Yeah, that movie, Amour, that really messed me up. Because my grandma had a stroke. And, and she lived for another 10 years after she had a stroke. And she couldn't talk. And um, yeah, I saw that movie. Oh man, he's yeah, he's the best. Like, it's a heartbreaker. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what I done it, but it was really interesting because I got to. Um, oh, what's her name? She just died. The woman who was the star of that movie. Uh, 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 Re Emmanuel Riva. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thank you. Emmanuel, thank you. <laughs> I, this is really embarrassing because <laughs> what I was gonna say is, um, she got an award at the New York Drama Critics for that performance, and. Um, uh, Michael Barger over at Sony Pictures Classics, he asked me, he's like, would you present her the award? And I was like, oh my God, I can't, sure, of course, because it was so moving. And um, really is embarrassing. I just have a really bad memory. So anyway, um, we went there, and I made the speech, and I made it all about my grandma. I was like, your performance is moving so much, and this is my grandma, and blah, blah, blah. And she was staring at me, and then she leaned over to somebody, and she came up again. I went back to the table, I was like, what was she saying? She's like, oh, she doesn't really, she didn't understand what you were saying. She doesn't, she doesn't speak English. <laughs> like, oh, okay. <laughs> Communication's always so hard. It is, it really is. It is. So I, we promised people that you didn't have a chance for a couple questions, and we started late because they had to bring out so many extra chairs. Oh my I God. Said, Would it be all right if we go till like 9.10 tonight? Yeah, yeah. Anna's sure. gonna set up a microphone and, and um, she'll put it here in the center, and hopefully we can get to one or two. So while she's doing that, let me ask you one, one other thing while she's setting it up. You mentioned John Cage, and I know David Byrne is a, uh, one of your musical idols. Do you have other, are there other forms of art or other artists that inspire you, not just in film or theater, but music, painting? Well, other well I mean, music is, yeah, music is, uh, music is a big one. I mean, I've said a lot of times that um, my favorite artist is uh, Thelonious Monk, who is my favorite of all time. And, um, yeah, if you haven't seen Straight No Chaser, you should see that. That's a good movie. That's my favorite Clint Eastwood movie. He produced it. Clint Eastwood, he's a weird one. <laughs> <laughs> I love him and I hate him. And yeah, in terms of poetry, uh, E. Cummings. I just read, uh, well, Dennis Johnson, great boy. He, he, Passed away, a, a novelist, uh, a friend of mine. Um, uh, you know, typical white boy shit. You know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Salinger, you know. <laughs> that was a perfect answer. Yeah. Please, let's take one or two questions. Hey man. Hey. <laughs> so uh, there's a couple. I'm an actor over at the uh, the theater school. Oh my god. Couple actors here. I was just there today. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But anyway, so I guess what you were saying about Michael's work is this great ability to just lay it out on the table, just tell the truth. I was just wondering if you had any sort of insight, tools for actors that can help them sort of get that sensor out of the way, that can help them. Oh man. I don't know. I think it, I, you know, a lot of it just comes from, from repetition. From the fact that I've been doing it a long time and the process of elimination, like, well, this doesn't work and that doesn't work and this is terrible. And then what you find out is when you whittle all these things away, um, you're like, oh, I think what people really want is they just want to watch 
like people being alive and like doing things. They don't need me to like do anything other than that. So and it's so deceptively, it's cruelly deceptively simple. But um, you know, a lot of the, you know, I like Meisner's take on it a lot more than um, than um, than um, Strasberg or, or those other guys. I really like how matter of fact his thing is. I know the whole repetition exercise seems so convoluted and weird, but I really think there's something to it. Because the other thing I realized is that the last thing you should be thinking about is yourself. Like, you should not be thinking about yourself at all. You should be thinking about everything else around you, all the other people around you. Um, what does what does that person need me to do in order to help them do what they need to do? And not, I never, I get so furious when I see actors like stopping the, the flow of progress by saying, well, I don't understand, or I don't know this, or I don't know that, or I, that my character would never do this. You know, I just, <laughs> I, just like, shut up, you know. You don't know, you don't know. Just try and figure it, it Stop saying no and just try and figure out what's going on. But you know, it, 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 it really does take that kind of, um, you know, it's, a, it's almost like a muscular thing. You just have to keep doing it and um, it gets, I, I really do believe it gets easier. You know, it's like a lot of people say um, about writing, they'll say like, oh, you have to write, what is it, like 40,000 words before you write anything worth anyone else reading or something like that. It's the same thing with acting. You just have to, I heard something that's like, yeah, if you can, if you can stay in acting for 20 years, you might be decent at it. It just takes 20 years. It just takes time, you know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm a really big fan. Thank you. 99 Rooms is one of my favorite movies. Oh, thank you. I also went to Trier. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it also sucked. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, a few guys and I, DePaul, are making a full length feature, and we were wondering if you were willing to maybe have, like, a vocal cameo in it. <laughs> you just make a line into my iPhone. A line in your iPhone? Oh, yeah. No. Okay. Okay. You see you were making a full length creature? No, I said a vocal cameo. Uh, no, but what, what are you making? A full length. A full length feature. I think you can make a feature. It's not like a competitive stuff that Paul these days. I'm yeah, talking to Michael Shannon. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. A full length feature. All right. Well, we can we can figure it out. All right. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Please. Hey. Uh, hey. So I um I'm a filmmaker at DePaul, okay. and um I just wanted to ask you like your philosophy about like what what of uh, art because like a lot of times like. In philosophy, like uh, art is considered like a way to like make people empathetic for other people and like make better societies, make better people. Um, and I struggle a lot with that um, with climate change, just like you were talking about earlier. Of like, how do you make people like care about that? So I was I was just curious of like, what what's like your philosophy about like what art is and like how do we how like do we make people like, like how, do we, how do we make better people or better societies through That's artists? a great question. I, yeah, I, I get where you're going. Well, the thing about art is, is it's not a dictatorship. You can't control other people's behavior. You can't control what other people think or do um, or feel. But you can throw your pebble in the pond and, and hope that someone else stares at it and that it makes them <laughs> think while they're watching it um, and it's not good you know I there's nothing you know for example with Take Shelter uh, you know I, there are people that watch Take Shelter and are very moved by it and there are people that turn it off after five minutes and think that's the boringest most stupidest shit I've ever seen in my life <laughs> you can't you can't help you just but I know for me it's it's important to me and I have a hunch that someone else <coughs> will get something out of it. And that's basically all you can hope for. 
you know, unless you want to be like Lenny Riffenstahl or something, and like, <laughs> I mean, that's you can't, thing. yeah. Art and propaganda, right? If you yeah. only make it so that it will accomplish this one thing, yeah. on some level you're not making art anymore. Yeah. You're making propaganda. Yeah, it's a, it's a really delicate thing, but you know, it is worthwhile, it, it, it is worthwhile. It's, it's, I, I, I know that, the, you know, things like take you know, 99 homes and things like that, I've seen it have an impact on people and, and uh, but it, yeah, you just, you can't, you can't, you, you can't make people do things through art, it's impossible, you know? Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. I tend to think, by the way, that just having a culture where you care about art and humanities, where it's at the front and you don't just pay it lip service, but you actually care about it, that's going to do good, regardless yes. of the content. Because it warms the collective consciousness. I mean, yeah. think about the vacuum or void that would exist if there was no art at all. You know, I just did um, a, a, a film version of Fahrenheit 451 that's going to be coming out um, on HBO. And it's something we explore, you know, is that, and, and, and it could easily happen. I mean, we're moving in that direction. And it's funny, because I always thought that book was so outlandish. It's like, this would never, you know, happen. And I don't, I don't necessarily think that, that, that anybody is ever going to burn every book on Earth. But, but we just seem to be moving in this direction away from art, particularly away from, like, funding art in the schools. And, and giving art to the children, um, and that 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 would create an I think it would be a soul crushing, depressing uh, uh, culture. I don't think we'd be able to stand it. So you just, you just keep making what you're making. You know? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to be kicked out of the room, so I apologize to everyone who is waiting to ask a question. Let a woman and ask a question. <laughs> we have to end because of the time right now, so I'm really, really sorry. Um, but I want to join me in thanking one more time for making a dream come true. And if I have any say in it, we'll have you back for an hour and five minutes of silence on stage. You've got to